one by two gun gun dekhna hai. How does a one by two? How does your one by two gun look like? One by two. Uh, well, the thing about uh, one over two is if you look in the wait, was this the right page? How do I zoom out? Uh, yeah, how do I zoom out again? Sorry. Oh, uh, no, no. Uh, there was something here. There. Yeah. So if you look at the function, actually. You will see that there are zeros in every reciprocal of a positive integer. So no, no one over two gone actually exists. <coughs> I hope that answers your question. Draw a circle. Yes. And now, uh, let us draw. Uh, can you pick some number greater than three? Okay, nine. Uh, that's a little hard, but we can try to accommodate that. So let's draw nine equally spaced dots on the circumference of the circle. So one, I guess, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Uh, they're not exactly equally spaced, but I hope you get the point. So I would rather do this with something easier to draw, like eight. <coughs> so this is what we would call a regular nine gone or not a gone, if you prefer to call it that. And if you want it to look nicer. This is what we would call a regular eight gon or octagon. So the circumradius of each of these regular polygons can be found uh, by simply taking it as the radius of the circle that inscribes them. So in this paper, we cover uh, every regular polygon with circumradius one. Now, someday, I hope to extend this to any uh, circumscribable polygon. Uh, so any polygon, not just regular polygons, they can be inscribed in a circle, such as this one. But for now, this is limited to regular polygons. So what is the perimeter function? Well. Given a unit circle, if we draw an inscribed equilateral triangle by putting three equidistant points, and this has radius one, uh, would anyone care to come up here to find the perimeter of this equilateral triangle? Is anyone willing? I know you all can do it. You are the student of the best university in, uh, in all of India, and this is a simple eighth grade problem. So who is willing to stand up? Three square root two, is it? Three square root two, right? Three square root two, right? Okay. So I'm guessing that uh, no one is willing to do it. All right. Well, we'll cover this one, and then hopefully you all will be able to do the next one. So, in order to find the perimeter of this triangle, given that this length is one. Well, first we just have to find the length of one side. One side. So this angle is 120 degrees, or if you prefer, 2 pi over 3 radians. My, uh, my shirt buttons are kind of causing some interference here. 2 pi over 3 radians, because the total number of radians in a circle is defined to be 2 pi, 
And we split it into three sectors that are each equal. So it should be 2 pi divided by 3. All right. So now, we also know that since this is a circle, these two both have radius, uh, length 1. So if this whole angle is 2 pi over 3, since this is an isosceles triangle, we can say that the altitude from this point to the base is also the perpendicular bisector and the angle bisector. So both of these have length pi over 3. Well, not length, but measure pi over 3. So now we want to find this length. And the trigonometric function, they can do that in just cosine. So this is cosine pi over 3. So what is this? Also cosine pi over 3. So that means that what we're looking for is 2 cosine pi over 3. Uh, and cosine pi over 3, it's pretty easy to figure out, is just the square root of 3 over 2. Well, you can also use a calculator. So, that gives us the square root of 3 for this side. And that means that every side has this uh, length of the square root of 3, which means that the total perimeter is 3 rad 3. <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. So, has everyone understood that example? Yes? Okay, so let's see if you can do the next one then. Don't pretend to understand. Oh, I have to do this. So, this time, I'm going to draw a square inscribed in a unit circle. Can someone come up here this time and find the perimeter of the square for me? One question is there. Yes. In the previous example, in the previous picture, you have uh, you have written there cos pi by three. I think it would be sine pi by three. Uh, no. Why not? Uh, this is the definition of the uh, cosine function. Yes. If you draw some angle theta. Yes. And then you draw the altitude from this point. Yes. Uh, onto one of the diameters of the circle. This has length one. Then cosine theta is defined as length. Yes, yes, yes. This is cosine pi by three. But, yes. but, but you have taken the pi by three at the top, at the vertex. Hmm? Isn't it? You have taken pi by three at the vertex. Uh, yes, and this one is pi by three. This length. Yeah. This angle is pi over 3. So the voltage would be oh, pi by 3. Oh, you are correct. I'm sorry. Oh. This would be sine. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry for that. So, uh, sine 60, yes, yeah, sine 60 to verify is square root of 3 over 2. I'm sorry for that mistake. Okay, no. Okay, carry on. Yes. So, uh, Instead of that, that's why, instead of making that mistake all over again, I go to use the law of cosines to derive this. Now, does anyone know what the law of cosines is? Okay. The distance would be like one, the square of the distance, the square of the distance would be one plus one minus two into Cos of that angle. One yes, that's correct. <laughs> so, c squared is a squared plus b squared minus 2ab cosine theta, where theta is the angle directly opposite c. So, in this case, c is the square root of 1 squared plus 1 squared minus 2 times 1 times 1 cosine 120. So that gives us the square root of 2 minus 2 cosine 120 
And the convenient thing about cosine 120 is that it's exactly minus one half, right? No, it's not minus one half. Uh, cosine 120. Minus root two, like. Oh yes, okay. Uh, so that does not provide a satisfactory answer either, no. It should not be minus root three over two, then. Two minus root. Hmm? Two minus, two plus root. No, this point should not be the square root of 2 plus root 3. That, hmm. All right, so I do we have to go with the alternate derivation of the formula? Sure, let's go with the alternate derivation. So, in general, that will mean that if we have an n-gon, so drawing a septagon is an example, if we have an n-gon, this angle is 2 pi over n. So if this is 2 pi over n, then this will be pi over n. And then that means that this angle will be sine of pi over n. Yes. So not this angle, this length. So that means that this total length, so it will be 2 sine of pi over n. And now uh, since n is the number of sides, that means the perimeter is just n times the side length. So the identical formula derived from the law of cosines would be the law of cosines is uh, going to be c is the square root of a squared plus b squared minus 2ab cosine theta. The, what? 2ab cosine theta. So, uh, this uh, would give, since a and, why is it doing that? So this would give, uh, since a and b are both one, one squared plus one squared minus two cosine theta. And theta in that case would be two pi over n. Why is it just randomly deleting my, okay. So this is two minus two cosine two pi over n. So this is the side length uh, so that means that the total perimeter <coughs> will just be n times this. Oh my gosh. So this gives us n root 2 root 1 minus cosine 2 pi over n. Now, uh, so let's rewrite that. Now geometrically, it's definitely intuitive that this should approach to pi. Why? Well, as you add more sides to a polygon, it starts looking more and more like a circle, correct? Yes, so. Everyone knows the uh, circumference or perimeter of a circle, right? Come on, everyone can just say it together. We all know, right? Okay, good. 2 pi r. Since r here is supposed to be 1, that means it should intuitively approach 2 pi. But how do we actually prove that? How is this going to approach 2 pi? Well, that's a good question, and I can give a good answer to that. So, first of all, let's substitute y, well no, I don't want confusion. Uh, let's do a substitution with some value, um, what's a suitable thing? Uh, let's say x prime is equal to 2 pi over x. Now, 
That means that the function f, fp of x prime is equal to 2 pi over x prime root 2 root 1 minus cosine x prime. Everyone gets what I did there, right? Correct? So uh, we just substituted 2 pi over x. x prime equals 2 pi over x for x here. So, uh, I hope that's evident because if you plug everything back in, 2 pi over 2 pi over x, root 2, root 1 minus cosine 2 pi over x, it goes back to the original. So, how do we know this approaches 2 pi actually without just a geometric intuition? Well, Let's factor out 2 pi from here to get 1 over x prime root 2 root 1 minus cosine x prime. So now, this approaches, this function approaches 2 pi as x approaches infinity, or at least it should. So, as x approaches infinity, 2 pi over x approaches. Okay, good. So, zero. So that means that as this function, as x prime approaches zero, this function should also approach 2 pi. Or, if we pretend that there was no 2 pi here, then this function, 1 over x squared root 2, root 1 over x. So 1 over x prime root 2, root 1 minus cosine x prime should approach 2 pi is x prime approaches 0. So, this looks very weird. However, uh, we can do something called a Taylor expansion, which is basically a polynomial approximation of functions that are not polynomials in order to get a nice answer to this. Because if we just try plugging in, we get 1 over 0, root 2, root 0, which gives us a very questionable answer. Oh, I forgot the 2 pi over here. Sorry. So, I mean, we can't do anything with this. So, plugging in is out of the question. So instead, we have to use a Taylor expansion to make this simple. Now, using the definition of a Taylor expansion, n equals 0 to infinity of f n of x over n factorial. So, using this, no, this would be zero. We can derive uh, that the Taylor expansion at x equals zero of cosine of x is, uh, well, does anyone want to come up here and derive it directly, or? You missed an n in the power. Sorry? Oh, sorry. Yes, that's the uh, that's correct. So, uh, if you're not aware, this gives you uh, cosine of zero over zero factorial, which is one uh, times no, not zero times x to the zero, which gives you one. That's the first term. And then the second term is, okay, where do I, oh yes, I can, there's a move this. So the first term is one, then the second term would tentatively be sine of zero times x divided by one factorial. Well, this is just zero. So this gives you nothing. And then the third term is going to be, well, the derivative, oh no, this is minus. So the third term is just going to be the derivative of minus sine of x. So you get minus x cosine of zero over two factorial, which gives you, oh, minus x squared, which gives you minus x squared over two. Now for very small values of x, this is basically everything we need. 
next few terms, if for reference, are x to the 4 over 24, uh, minus x to the 6 over uh, 720, etc. Now, these terms amount to basically nothing for x is less than 1 half. And that's what we're covering here, since x is approaching 0. So, all we have to do is take 1 minus x squared over 2, and we should have got it. So, plugging that in, we get that this function, one, uh, 2 pi over x prime root 2, with 1 minus cosine x prime, is approximately, for x prime, is approximately 0. 2 pi over x prime, root 2, root 1 minus 1 minus x squared over 2. Now, I hope you all can see how this resolves, because it just gives you this, and these two cancel out, which gives you, oh, I have to use this, which gives you 2 pi over x prime times the square root of x prime squared. So these cancel out in order to give you 2 pi. So that's the behavior of the function near infinity. And that's interesting enough. But what's even more interesting is the behavior of the function below 1. So I'm just going to draw an approximate graph because I don't actually have a calculator with me today. So we have a lot of very small humps. And then here it has what we call a horizontal asymptote at 2 pi, not to scale. So, uh, what is very interesting is the behavior of this function for numbers below 1. So, it gives you these parabolic-like shapes, but it turns out these shapes are not actually parabolic. Now, it's easy enough to figure out the zeros of this function. So, let's see. So it's easy enough to figure out the zeros of this function and to 1 minus cosine 2 pi over n. Now, when is this equal to 0? Well, at n equals 0, obviously. But also when this is 0, and when is this 0? Well, when 1 minus cosine 2 pi over n is 0. And when is cosine 2 pi over n equal to 1? Well, 2 pi over n equals so n is 1 over k. So understandably, it's the reciprocal of every positive integer. 1 over 1, 1 over 2, 1 over 3, etc. So, we get that this is 1, this is 1 half, this is 1 third. But what's even more interesting is the local maxima of this function. Because they don't exactly come in the best moments. So, for example, the first local maxima of this function is not at 0 0.75, as you might expect from the drawing, because it's just a midpoint of 0, uh, 0 0.5 and 1. Rather, it looks to be 0 0.699, approximately. And things get straighter and straighter as you approach 0. Uh, for example, not all of these humps, as it may appear from my crude drawing, are actually the same. None of them are congruent. Uh, in fact, this one is slightly long, but this one is slightly more stretched out than this one, which is more stretched out than this one, which is more stretched out than that one, and so on and so forth. So, all of these observations are made up to what? Because, well, a polygon is only defined 
for uh, integer numbers that are greater than or equal to three, right? <clears throat> well, not exactly, because me and my collaborator have found a way to define a polygon with any rational number of sides. So, uh, incidentally, uh, <clears throat> the formula obviously works for the polygon we all know, but it also works for what we call quasi-polygons. So what is that? Well, let me try drawing a three over eight god. So a polygon with 0.375 sides. So this is very hard to imagine, understandably, but let's try it uh, over here. And then what we're going to do is we're going to go uh, let's call one of these arc lengths uh, L. So this length, this arc is of length L. Then, what we're going to do is we're going to travel 8 times L along the circle. So that's 3L, that's 6L, 7L, and 8L. And then we're going to draw a point from here to there. And then we go around one more time, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and so that's where we stop next. And incidentally, this looked like a triangle, but some other ones are more strange. Like for example, an eight over five god. So let's say we draw eight studs, equally spaced. Five L, four, five. So, then we go another length of five L, two, one, two, three, four, five. And then another one, two, three, four, five. Yes? Yes, it is a star. Um, um, uh, one, two, three, four, five. And I think that it should be pretty incidental that this looks like a star. This is just my approximate drawing of it. Probably not correct. But this is how an 8 over 5 god looks. Now, wouldn't this be the same as an 8 over 3 god? Or an 8 over... Uh, or an 8 over 7 god, or anything else like that? Well, yes, but its perimeter is different. Now, what is its perimeter defined as? Well, it's just the perimeter of a regular octagon, or 8 god, divided by the number of times we've gone around the circle. So, in this case, I'm pretty sure we've gone 5 times around the circle, so it just go to be the output that we had before, This is just going to be 8 root 2 root 1 minus cosine pi over 4 divided by 5. So, finally, you, uh, you all are probably thinking, how is this useful? Well, probably not some of you, because some of you are pure math students. But, how is this useful? Well, what I want to use this for is there are some functions, like for example this one, some functions that simply cannot be integrated uh, using regular techniques. Now this one ends up being this, but what is this function exactly? No one can tell me. I can't tell myself either. So. Uh, so, I hope to use uh, this kind of thing to approximate areas of uh, integrals of functions that cannot be, uh, uh, where an antiderivative cannot be found regularly. So, in this case, sine of e of x kind of looks like this, uh, sort of like sine of 1 over x, I believe, where it has this shape in the beginning, 
which can be described like regular sodium soil, but over time it starts to approach its body angular shape, uh, they could be approximating using what we have. So, we could also use this to approximate uh, the length, which is more direct, the length over a curve, because uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, this is the current formula for uh, the length from A to B over a continuous function f of x, and this is uh, not very suitable to integrate for lots and lots of functions. So, I hope to change that, or at least approximately change that, using uh, this discovery. So yes, that's about all I have to say, and thank you everyone. It was an honor to be talking here at the University of Kolkata, uh, even while I am uh, under the weather in order to spread knowledge and inspiration about even the simplest of ideas. Are you always going to take it as 3 by 8 only? Oh, Otherwise, yes. if you take it as 6 by 16, it will not meet, right? Uh, if you take it as uh, 6 over 16, it will meet, but it looks slightly different. So, we always take it in lowest form, uh, just so uh, the function is consistent. Okay. Thank you. How does the 1 by 2? How does your 1 by 2 one look like? 1 by 2? Uh, well, the thing about uh, 1 over 2 is if you look in the... F Wait, was this the right page? How do I zoom out? Uh, yeah, how do I zoom out again? Sorry. Oh, uh, no, no. Uh, there was something here. There. Yeah, so if you look at the function, actually, you will see that there are zeros in every reciprocal of a positive integer. So no, no one over two god actually exists. I hope that answers your question. So this is not my question. Like uh, I can just suggest to you, the picture you have shown in the in the in the, lab, in the green board, uh, there's some uh, figure uh, and uh, the figures are they just like starlight figure. There may be there may be three point five points as a super uh, and so on and so on. Uh, but I can remember one time that there is a, a relation between uh, components modulo. You can uh, you can actually tell that area uh, with this picture. Okay, I can suggest. Uh, uh, so far as I know, there is a great relation. Uh, the, this method which you have done uh, the, the free board, uh, there is some complex relation with uh, mm, uh, with this feature also. Okay? You can think about it. You can tell me in future. Okay. So what will be a 3 by 7 and 5 by 7 guns? Okay, I don't, I don't want to make this whole uh, question session about drawing uh, fractional uh, polygons, but uh, if I must, I think it will look similar, uh, but the perimeter will technically be different. So it will actually, everything must look like an equilateral triangle. After all, what else will it look like? But uh, this time, It will have a quasi perimeter, or whatever we call it, of 3 root 3 over 7 instead of 3 root 3 over 8. Why exactly? Well, uh, let's see how it looks like. So this goes around 1, uh, M, 1 arc length, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. I don't want to do the whole slow process again, but just know. That the total arc length traveled uh, is 21L, uh, which is 7 times the circumference. 
since L is just one third of the circumference. <coughs> which is why we quantify it as 3 root 3 over 7 instead of 3 root 3 over 8 as we did here. Now 5 over 7 is going to look like a pentagonal star, I believe, but I can't say that exactly without checking it. So it'll look as if 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, what? Uh, 6, 7. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And yes, after all, it does look like a pentagonal star. So uh, this one also has the quasi-perimeter of 5 square root of 2 square root of 1 minus cosine 2 pi over 5 <coughs> divided by 7. I hope uh, those are the two descriptions that you were looking for. Yes? So you have defined n gone when n is a rational number. Okay. Yes. So is it possible to define uh, when n is an irrational number? For an irrational number, yes. we are still... Root thinking, two, for example, root two gun, is it possible? We are still figuring that out. Of course, you can plug those values in, but there was a big question on whether you could actually geometrically define them. So, uh, we will see if we can technically define them, but as of now, I would say no. But uh, maybe we could define them using infinite series, but I can't say anything for that. And definitely they're not transcendental numbers. There are no way we will be able to define a polygon with a transcendental amount of size. Yes, sir. one subject, you know, we are basically associated with the finance commerce. But there is a curiosity that is in the TDAs we have uh, found that 2 multiplied by 0 is equal to 2, but 2 divided by 0 is equal to undefined. Uh, could you in lucid manner, uh, you know, say why this call that is undefined 2 divided by 0? So actually, uh, it is not our subject. So just, you are the specialist, you, you are the professor or professor, I believe, is not age as far as your knowledge is concerned. So we respect you. So in that way, could you explain? According to your way, J2 multiplied by 0 uh, is equal to 2. No, it's zero. Zero. 0. 0. But 2 divided by 0 is equal to undefined. But why? A very good question. Um, there is actually a very common answer to this that I will just repeat. So, for example, if you think about numbers as they get smaller, like, for example, let's say we have. 2 million. If we divide it by 1, this will give us 2. Uh, wait, if we divide this by 1 million, we will get just 2, right? But if we divide this by 100,000, then we will get 20. If we divide this by 10,000, we will get 200. If we divide this by 1,000, we will get 2,000, and so on. So as we get smaller and smaller, once we get to 1, we will get 2 million. And as the denominator gets smaller, the answer only gets larger and larger. So theoretically, the answer should be infinity, right? But really, that comes the question of what we call in math cardinality. I'm sure a lot of the pure math students here have heard of this. So basically, it's just the study of the real size of infinity. So, if this is infinity, what is 1 over 0? What is 2 over 0? What is 3 over 0? Are they different from one another? Should one be bigger than the other? What is 2 times infinity? Is 2 times 2 over 0 4 over 0? Or 2 over 0? Or what? So, we can't really definitively say that it is infinity either. So, instead, we just leave it as undefined. Yes, sir. 
Thank you, thank you very much, Shubhano. If there is no other question, then we'll end this talk here. And I request, I request uh, our colleague, Shubhana Shen. Dr. Shubhana Shen, are you here? Okay. Uh, Shubhana, please. Uh, for pursuing such serious mathematics at such a tender age, which is really to be very commendable. Okay, so next I would like to thank all the university authorities, uh, especially our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor Shanta Dotto, our Honorable Registrar, Professor Devashish Dash, and our uh, university engineer, Sri Shubhashi Shannal and all the other office uh, officials who have made it possible to hold this colloquial talk today here in the Centenary Hall. Then I would like to thank all the department, uh, faculties, students, research scholars, uh, ex-students, uh, staffs, and our head of the department who have volunteered and worked so much towards making this program a success. And finally, I would like, like to thank the audience uh, for joining us today and listening to Shuporno's talk. Hope we strive for academic excellence as we do in the university. Thank you very much. I request our honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor Shanta Bhattade, to say a few words. Good afternoon. I am delighted to welcome to this special event at our University of Calcutta. Today, we, we are honored to have with us a young protege, Shubano Isaac Bari, and his father. Our warm welcome to them. The University of Calcutta, with his rich heritage, in the fields of mathematics, physics, biological science, literature, social science, etc., has always been a beacon of knowledge and learning. Our illustrious Vice Chancellor, Sir Ashutosh Mukherjee, himself a renowned mathematician, laid the foundation of pursuit of excellence of these fields. Today, we continue to uphold his legacy by welcoming and honoring our achiever, young achiever and talents. Shubharno Isaac Bari is one such extraordinary talent. At the age, at the very tender age of 11, he has achieved feats that many only dream of. His accomplishment are truly inspiring. The mathematics and scientific world are eagerly awaiting to see him flourishing to the full of his potential in the coming years. We are extremely grateful to Shubhano and his father for coming here in spite of so many, so many hurdles created by bad weather in their journey to Kolkata. We eagerly look forward to his lecture and the opportunity to interact with him. We believe that his presence here today inspires our students and faculty alike. Thank you so much. Thank you, madam. We have tea outside, so please uh, feel free to go. Okay. She wanna be Thank you. Thank you.